So we have five amazing people who will join us today. Uh, the first will is pre-recorded due to the time zone differences, uh, but it is just as much as exciting as everything else we'll hear tonight. So um, thank you all for attending. Uh, I'd just like to start by uh, acknowledging uh, and celebrating the first Australians uh, who's on land we meet. So in Canberra, where I am currently based, and at least uh, two others were on Ngunnawal and Nambri land. Uh, and as part of this, we're doing this event as part of Science Week. Science Week is this national festival, as I'm sure most people know, in Australia, uh, all across, and technically yesterday was the start of it. Uh, so this is the first of many events that will be happening over the next week and a half. Tomorrow, there's actually another webinar uh, done through the ACT Science Week on food and food security. Um, go to the Science Week details to check it out. So it's all about food. And today it's all about food and space. Um, and before we begin, I just, you know, just to set the scene, we hear a lot about humans going into space, whether it be the moon, going to Mars, the work on the space station. And it's not as simple as people go up and people eat. There is a lot to it. A lot, um, a lot of science, a lot of engineering, uh, a lot of technical bits that has to go into make it successful space travel. And today or tonight, wherever you are, we're still on Earth. If you're not from Earth watching this, more power to you. Um, for as part of this, we all have to deal with this. And there's a lot happening in the US, as you'll hear. There's a lot happening in Australia, as you'll hear tonight. And I think that's kind of the exciting thing. This is such a big area happening for human space flight and space travel that maybe doesn't get as much attention as which billionaire and their rocket they've liked this week. But this is where a lot of the work is happening to make human space flight a success. And so for the first speaker today, it is a pre-recorded session because Shannon Walker uh, couldn't get the timing right to work with us, which is a shame, but she has recorded and shared her insights on her experience as human spaceflight. Uh, and I am going to virtually pre-recorded, recorded, hand it over to Shannon. It's the beauty of technology now. And we'll hear from Shannon Walker. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, and uh, we have the pleasure today of having uh, astronaut Dr. Shannon Walker, uh, who's most recently uh, been on the expedition 64 and 65 uh, in 2020. Uh, and, um, doing some exciting things in space. And as we talk about living and food in space, it's great to hear from someone who's actually had to live and eat in space. Uh, so I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And really, first, I wanted to talk about what food is actually like in space, what most of our food is like. Um, we have food that comes up in packages like this. Uh, it's called, it's thermostabilized, so it can last a very long time, and we usually just heat it up by sticking it in a food warmer that puts heat on it, and we've got some nice tasty hot food to eat. Other food that we have up there is dehydrated, and it comes up in packages like this. This is some, uh, some green beans, actually. Um, so we have a, a way to put hot water or ambient water into a food package. You can mix it all up, and... Uh, have different kind of food to eat. So this is pretty much the two main foods that the US uh, provides to its astronauts. Um, other food comes up in cans. Um, here's, a, here's a picture of some Russian food. Most of the Russian food that comes up in cans. Um, and you'll actually see there in the middle of that that we have some little plants that were grown. The Russians grew some basil while we were up there, which was, was wonderful to eat. So uh, food is, is packaged. Um, and really the time you ever get fresh food, which we don't get often, is when a cargo vehicle arrives. Um, and, and when we do get fresh food, oops, that's a little early there. So when we do get fresh food, um, it's really limited in variety because it's got to be able to withstand launch loads and it's got to be able to be packed ahead of time. So something like a banana is not going to survive the trip to space. So you will get things like oranges, maybe some apples, depending. Um, maybe some onions, some garlic, things like that, that you can actually, that can be jostled around and have a, a pretty long shelf life. 
Um, another thing about the space station is that we actually have very limited refrigeration. We basically have no refrigeration. refrigeration. So um, what we have is tiny refrigerators that are about the size of a shoebox, maybe a little bit bigger. So we're able to keep a few things in there, maybe cool down a drink or keep some condiments. Um, and occasionally, occasionally we have some freezers that we can use. Usually that happens when the ground needs to send up some, some frozen uh, science samples and they might sneak in, I don't know, an ice cream treat or something to us and we're able to stick it in a freezer. But then usually we get a message not too long after that saying, hey, we need the freezer in two days. So you guys got to eat that ice cream. So, um, you know, the, the options that we have for food, types of food are, are rather limited. Um, and I also want to point out that most of food that comes up there already comes with the flavor. Um, you really don't have a blank canvas to work with. So you might have uh, maybe some teriyaki chicken or a meatloaf or something. It's not like you've got this, uh, say, uh, just a plain chicken breast where you can decide, oh, I'm going to make that into some chicken marinara or I'm going to make that into some basil something or another. So um, the canvas you have to work with with your food is a little bit limited. Um, but it's actually, they do a good job. We actually do have a lot of variety. So this picture here, I wanted to show, I know it looks a little strange, but this is actually um, some Japanese curry that we had on board. And um, there's a couple of things I wanna point out about this, this picture. One is that uh, this is sort of the consistency of most of our food. It's sort of uh, like a stew. It's got a uh, liquid that's gonna hold it everything, hold everything together so it will stick to your spoon. Most often we only eat with the spoon. We need it to stick together because otherwise food would just go floating off everywhere. So we're very limited in the amount of crunchy food that we have. We don't have a whole lot of food that's gonna make a lot of crumbs. We really don't have. Another thing I find interesting about this particular thing is you can see that there is a lot going on in this curry. It's got some noodles, it's got some vegetables, it's got some uh, meat in there, and it's got a lot of flavor. Most of the food that the U.S. sends tends to be a single item in a package. You might have a package that's got some sort of chicken. You might have a package that's got some sort of vegetable. You might have a package that's got some sort of fruit in it, but there's no real good combinations of food. Um, which just makes it interesting and sometimes challenging to build a meal because you've got this variety of stuff, but the way the food was developed, it wasn't developed as meals. And so you might get lucky one day when you've got all your different uh, food containers open looking for something to eat and you might have, say, uh, some meatloaf, some mashed potatoes and some broccoli with cheese that's available. That's great. That's sort of a coordinated meal that we might have on the ground. The next day you might get in there and there's not gonna be something like that. You might still have the broccoli, but you might only have say some teriyaki chicken. And so broccoli and cheese and teriyaki chicken, while they're both tasty, is not necessarily something that you might put together on the ground as a meal. So um, not having foods built as meals uh, can have its pluses and minuses. You get a variety of choices, but it doesn't always sort of make sense as what you're eating. Um, now, a lot of people, on earth and in space sort of go up and say food is just fuel food is not important i don't happen to be one of those um i happen to be one of the type of people that i'm very interested in food and interested in a variety of factors i'm interested in the nutrition that that food can pro provide the flavor textures combinations food groups all of that which i think is important um because it all, all of that enhances my enjoyment of food the people that start off as food is fuel um, often come back saying that they wish they had spent more time thinking about their food choices on orbit. When we fly, we are able to take a little bit of our uh, food that we choose ourselves to go up. It's got to meet certain standards, but you might say, you know what, breakfast is really important to me. I want to take more breakfast foods just to make sure I have the things I like. Um, food becomes very, very important on long duration, long duration flights. So let's see, uh, so what do we do about it? Well, long duration flights, as I said, it's important. You can and do get what we call food fatigue um, because of limited choices. Actually, we have a lot of choices. Um, being part of an international space station is great because we actually have access to international food. So you have more choices than if any one country was providing um, the food. 
but after a while it just gets it gets tiresome and and really even with all the choices you have each individual person may not like everything and so you tend to eat less variety um, that's actually available to you so when we have an opportunity we try and innovate where we can with food so this picture here is um i think it was one of our holidays that we had up there and we uh decided to try and create just a different a different taste i found some crackers um i stuck them with a little bit of sauce to that that tray that i have and then we took our condiments and just made made i don't know like little mini pizzas or something so we have on there a little bit of a little bit of garlic paste we have a little bit of tomato paste we have a little bit of of basil and a little bit of balsamic vinegar so we made great use of our condiments to make a little appetizer before we um, sat down to our, our floated down to our our dinner so try and innovate when you can but just the nature of the food can make it really difficult i will say though uh, we definitely have more variety now than when i flew a decade ago uh, we've got more flavor profiles, we've got more spice profiles, which is really nice, and we have a more modern take on vegetables. And what I mean by that is um, more variety of vegetables in the way they're prepared is, has changed over the years, where in the past you might just have some something that's the equivalent of a can of mixed vegetables for your vegetable choices. Um, now, for example, we had this really tasty kale salad it wasn't a fresh kale salad but it was kale that that was cooked and it had some like some dried fruit in there and some nuts and so kind of the things that we're doing with food now um we're able to the the food labs are able to reproduce and have on orbit which is great we also have more fish dishes on orbit um we did i don't think we had any fish up there when we were there previously um but fish is very important for nutrition and nutrition is hugely important when you're in space. Um, I do think we have much more, um, uh, much more nutri nutritious foods available than uh, we've had in the past. Um, the reason that nutrition is so important is we have we do have a concern that people lose weight on orbit, and so you've got to strike a balance between getting enough calories to maintain your weight and having the right. Uh, nutrition that's going to be good for your muscle, your muscles, your bones, and your body. Um, you know, you could eat, say, chocolate pudding cake, which is delicious and one of the most highest calorie foods we have up there. You could eat that all the time, but that's not going to provide you good nutrition. Um, so, um, you know, not only do you want to be healthy, but we are test subjects for a lot of experiments. And so if you're eating, you know, it's a classic garbage in, garbage out. If you are not eating good food, you're not gonna be a good test subject. And so if you, um, you know, want to be, you know, have good science, we need to have good food. Um, another problem that we have with food up there is that there is a vitamin loss in foods that are stored for a long period of time. And most of the foods, like the packages I showed you, are, are made such that they can, they can last they will be good to eat several years down the road but over time the vitamins break down so um you know that's not going to be good for say a mars mission you need to have you need to have the nutrition when you get there you know six months nine months a year after you launch so we're working on technologies to um create more nutrition and food this uh, while it does look like I've got a tray of cocktails there, it is not a tray of cocktails. Um, this is a, an experiment called Bionutrient, and um, it is looking at ways to um, basically develop technology that will enable on-demand production of, of nutrients for the human body during long-duration space missions. So what it's doing is looking at using engineered microbes, say a yeast, to produce some of the nutrition we need. Um, we are studying that now, and uh, hopefully that will pay off dividends when we go on um, much longer uh, missions farther away from Earth. Um, another way, of course, to get nutrition is to grow your food. And this is uh, the second half of what I really wanted to talk about. So we've got the foods that are prepared on the ground, and then we've got things that we can grow. Um, this is a picture of some radishes that we grew up there. Uh, they 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 did great. They were actually really tasty. A lot of what we grow now gets sent back down to the ground for analysis. So we don't get to eat nearly as much as you see there, which is unfortunate. Um, but we do have a couple of, of 
locations on the station right now where we can grow food. That first one is a, is a facility called Plant Habitat. This one is me um, working with some, some plants in the veggie facility. Um, so um, things grow, we've gotten where things grow really, really well on the space station. Um, when I was up there, I don't know what, I don't remember what I'm actually working with there, but we grew a variety of things um, this last time. We grew some pak choy, some red romaine lettuce, some kale, some uh, mustard plants. I even think we grew some wasabi plants um, up there, which was, which was great. And here, I'll just show you how well things do grow. This is a time lapse overnight, one night of some of the kale um, that grew. And so you can see we've got it down that things, things grow very well in space. Um, but what we don't have is a lot of things growing in space. Um, and what we're doing now is so much of our, our growing of plants is done in very close conjunction with people on the ground, which is great for um, growing healthy plants. Um, we've got the experts on the ground, we've got the biologists that know how to grow plants, um, but it's really not gonna be a long-term solution because we're not gonna be able to have sort of the real time back and forth that we have now uh, when we go on, on, on to Mars. So what we wanna do is be able to um, have more autonomy, I think, with the crews to be able to, um, to grow things themselves. And we actually did this last time, um, we were up there, we had some leftover seeds that we were able to take and, and try our hand at growing plants ourselves. Um, we were actually pretty successful. And here actually is a, is a little snippet of Mike Hopkins doing some um, harvesting of some of the mustard that we grew up there. And so you can see the really healthy plants, um, plants grow well in space, but we just need to take the, the next step to, um, to do a large, larger scale production of food. Um, during this harvest, oh, looks like that stopped, that video stopped. Let me see, nope, nope, maybe I can get it. Well, you know, we can put stuff, people on the moon, but we can't get the technology to work. Okay, so uh, we'll just try that one again. Doesn't really matter. Um, so um, let's see, where was I growing? We're harvesting some mustard here. So. When we did harvest, as I said before, we got to eat some of the plants and we got pretty creative at how we were um, eating the plants. Um, some of the pot choy that we grew, I uh, was able to take some food packets and uh, after we had eaten the food out of them, reuse those, those packets to, to sort of braise the pot choy. I would put the pot choy leaves in a food packet. I would put some uh, garlic paste and a little bit of soy sauce and put it in the oven and heat it up. And so there's, there's a kind of harvest that we can get. You can get a lot of, a, of, of, of leaves from, from what you're growing. So um, of those mustard leaves, I believe we made um, wraps out of them. So we used them as our, as our wrap material and, and put either some chicken or some sort of um, meat inside or veggies even inside and ate them, which was great. And it was so nice to have something different. It's nice to have different tastes and different textures up there. Um, but again, we, I think we need more autonomy and automation, which I know people are working on to be able to grow plants. I, I, I think, you know, in my ideal world, if I were going onto Mars, I would love an entire module dedicated just to growing plants because um, one, you'd have a lot of variety you could grow and then you'd be able to do things like do succession planting so you would have a continuous harvest. So it wasn't just like you're growing one bit of food, you get one harvest and you have to eat it all right away and then wait till the next um, ones grow. So bottom line, um, plants, plants in space are a necessary part of long duration space travel. Um, they can provide needed nutrition that in addition to what you're getting from the prepackaged food that's gonna be sent with you. Um, working with plants, for me, it was a very relaxing thing to do. It was very uh, just nice to take a break and spend some time amongst the plants. Um, obviously, they can provide a welcome for, uh, variety in your diet. Um, they can provide beauty. Uh, you saw on that first slide that we had actually taken some leaves and just put them on our table as like a centerpiece before we ate them. Um, and, and mostly um, plants are a connection to earth. And so um, there's so many reasons to have, have plants in space, not just for the nutrition, but just 
for being part of being human. And that is my summary, quick summary on food and plants and space. So I would love to answer any questions if you have any. Yeah, look, we have a few from both. I, I've, I've pre-solicited and, and based on what you said, and, and actually something you were touching on there that the food changed, you said quite in, in a lot of ways from your first space flight to your second, and then obviously the needs for Mars. So is food one of the biggest things that you think, or one of the big areas changing in space flight, especially long duration space flight? I think, I think it is. Um, one of the, when I came back from my first flight, which was a decade ago, um, some, uh, I and a couple of other people from the astronaut office got together with our food lab folks and with the program people that are running these missions and said, hey, we think we need, we think we can do better with food. We think we can um, um, improve it and we'd like to be part of developing new foods so we can have better nutrition, better, um, better variety uh, to get what we need to do. And, and actually it's kind of interesting because the foods that are being developed now for what we're doing, planning for our lunar missions is very different from what we're um, serving on the station. And I think what we're doing on the station is gonna be more akin to what we do to Mars, but what we need for our lunar missions is gonna be very different. And so uh, that's a, just a, an interesting offshoot of, of what we're doing now in food development for space travel. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's interesting to think about you'll be eating differently depending on where you are. Um, yeah, yeah, so, it all has to do with the mission on in the moon. Um, you might be in a habitat and then you need to go out and do an EVA or a spacewalk on, on the surface of the moon and then come back. And so you may not have time in your day or you in a habitat early missions, there's not gonna be a lot of space. And so you need very, um, very dense, high calorie foods that you can eat quickly to accomplish your mission and then, you know, then get on with the rest of it. One thing I thought I found interesting when you're talking about it is, I guess, the differences between the countries of the astronauts who go up and then not just what food they bring, but also how they bring it. Um, do you know some of the reasonings behind it? Is it cultural? Is it historical? I mean, I assume obviously all the scientists are making sure they all have the same nutritional value, obviously, as you talked about, but it is definitely interesting, the approaches. Yeah, the, the approaches are different. And so um, I would say with the Russians, um, their, their food is based on their historical um, food development of through their space flight is certainly the case with our food a lot of our food early days um, on the space station was based on the kinds of food we ate on the space shuttle and so and now now we realize that we needed to modify that some early days with the space shuttle we would eat a lot of things that um that say came from the military the meals ready to eat because it was already pre-packaged well that's not quite the right nutrition that we need in space and um, so we started developing more of our own foods and I, I'm not sure how much we get now from the military, but we're, we're doing, actually, I don't think very much at all, if any. Um, so, you know, we've developed different things and then the, the, you know, Japan has their food development, Canada has done some food development and, and Europe has done a lot too. And, and a lot of the things say with, uh, Thomas Pesquet, who's up there now, French, uh, the French foods, you know, they're looking for different um, aspects of, of palate and presentation and things like that. So you can get, you can have like a can of food that looks like a can of food, or you can have a can of food that looks really pretty when you open it and has, you know, different flavor profile. So yeah, it's good. It's good because variety is the spice of life. It is. Well, as you said, it, it's nice that you get to share, right? That you're not saying, oh, well, yes. you know, that's the French food. You can't touch it. That's nice to hear. Right. Uh, um, yeah. So you said that you're allowed to bring up some sort of, or more importantly, I guess, request food. So is, is there a limit on how much you can request and can you, do you get to request for every cargo resupply? So it's done by numbers of containers. And so you have a, a box of food, so yay big, and um, you get nine of them for your, for your space flight for six okay. months on station. And so um, if it fits in there and it passes the test and, you know, you might have some, some weight constraints, um, then you can probably get it sent up. And so what I tell people now that are, that are contemplating what foods they want to take is really go for variety. You've got, you've got all the standard stuff. You might like all the standard stuff, but you're going to want something different. And there's a lot of really good 
packaged food that that can work with our system that you can just heat up and eat um, that that we don't normally have. And and if it, like I say, passes whatever test that the the food lab says it needs to pass, then you can probably have it. And that's good. And so, and this was actually following on. This was a question that someone sent in from one of the, the participants. Was there any foods or tastes or flavors that you missed because you weren't allowed to have it in space? Definitely. Um, a lot of it is is texture because, um, like I said, I'm someone that, that likes a lot of different texture. And so if your food's kind of mushy all the time, you miss just crunching into something. And then some standards, like we don't have pizza up there, you know, kicking back on a Friday night and having a slice of pizza is, is a really nice thing to do. Well, we don't get to do that. Um, we don't have living in Texas, Tex-Mex food is really big. So we don't have a lot of, you know, none of that is in our standard food, but we're able to find similarities of, of food, uh, packaged food to send up that we did have some, but yeah. So yeah, you miss a lot. I'll, yeah, a lot. <laughs> and, and, and when you came down, was there anything that you, not just necessarily that you, you wanted, but also didn't want like saying, all right, well, I ate so much of that in space. I, I don't want to see it again. No, I don't think it was really anything I didn't want because it's all going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely things I wanted to eat and a lot of fresh foods. You know, I just craved a big salad. You mm. know, I haven't had fresh vegetables, a good salad. I eat a lot of salads on the ground. And so that was that was something I was definitely craving when I came back. Well, I can see that. Um now, when with some of the the foods and the vegetables that you were just talking about, they're grown uh, in space. Um, and, you know, it's remarkable how well they grow. Did, did was there any subtle differences in in taste or texture between the food grown in space and some of the similar plants or species on Earth? Or don't hard to say. You know, I don't I don't think so. Of course, the researchers could tell you exactly yeah. what the differences were, if there are any. But for me, being able to eat some of that, it tasted like I expected the foods to taste. And so that that's really good and nice that it, you can grow something familiar and have it actually be familiar when you're eating it. Mm. And, and, and I'll probably, I guess, ask this, this last one. If, you know, especially as we were talking about going to Mars and, you know, and your idea of, well, we'll probably potentially will need entire modules are dedicated to this, um, do, you, do you think that nutrition, and I, I think you kind of touched on this in food, is more than just a, a physical requirement, but also the importance, like psychologically and socially as well, about how that plays in, you know, being able to grow and have access to fresh food is more than just nutrition a bit? Yeah, I do. I do think it's more than just nutrition. Um, the, I think the food fatigue is really real. And I, you know, I know how I and don't get me wrong, the food that our food labs produce is really good. But after six months of the same thing, you're looking for a change. And so if you can, you know, if you think for a, of a Mars mission that may be two years in length, you're going to need more variety than we're able to provide right now. And so growing, growing food is going to be hugely important, nutrition and psychologically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for all of your experiences. Uh, and I guess maybe now everyone will appreciate crunchy food in a way they uh, <laughs> haven't been able to do right. before. Exactly. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, yes, it was great to hear from Shannon. And yes, that, that was pre-recorded because we couldn't get the time zones to work out. Um, however, a few things she mentioned on will be perfect um, and talked exactly about our next panelist, uh, who is here um, live. So, uh, and she's one of he's one of the people that Shannon referenced is part of this team working on Earth to solve some of these problems. Uh, so, Ralph Frisch is our next speaker, and so it, he's the space crop production manager at NASA. Like, did you realize there was actually a space crop production manager? That's I sh think shows how big this effort is. So he's leading the effort to develop the sustainable and reliable fresh fruit systems uh, that Shannon uh, brought up uh, and specifically in support of those long duration missions that are gonna go beyond Earth's orbit. So like to the moon and Mars. Uh, Ralph began his career at NASA in 1989 and so he supported the US space program, the human space flight and the variety of engineering uh, and operational roles. Uh, and is now here today to talk about exactly what is this technique and what are the technologies and what are the efforts going in exactly on this. 
Uh, so he's the one who's keeping people like Shannon nutritionally fed up in space. So I'll hand it over to Ralph. Thank you, Brad. Um, it was very interesting to see uh, Shannon's uh, presentation. Uh, she's a, a quite the ambassador for what we do. And actually, I guess maybe it's a, it's a mutual uh, love fest in that regard, um, because our whole job is to uh, keep crew healthy and operating at peak performance. Um, I was debating as to how to begin my presentation, and I think that she did such a good overall job. I'm just going to stress a few points that she may have glossed over for uh, due to the amount of time involved, and then I'll segue into uh, where we're planning on going for the future with a couple of slides. Um, I think it's important if you listen to what Shannon talked about that there's really three components of the current food system that's on the International Space Station now. Uh, one of them is the prepackaged food that she mentioned, and that's the thermostabilized food or the food that needs to be reconstituted with water. That forms the bulk of the food system, and we can expect that as we go missions to the moon, long duration missions to the Mars, that it'll still be that prepackaged food that serves as the bulk and basis of the food system. Uh, then she spoke about um, getting fresh fruit resupply. So that's a component that we're not gonna have access to when we actually make the journey towards uh, Mars and we have these longer missions to the moon. You may get some of it, but it'll be limited. Um, missions to Mars though, you're not gonna have that. So fresh food will not be something that you're gonna be able to acquire periodically from the ground. And that's part of the motivation behind us supporting growing um, our fresh crops for the mission as Shannon alluded to uh, in her talk. And then the third part is crew preference items. And, and again, crew preference items are likely to either go away or be significantly reduced, specifically because um, it's very likely that for some cases, we're going to have to pre-deploy food. And that means we're gonna have to send the food up to Mars before the crews ever get there, which means that those foods could be sent maybe a, a year, two years, should be two years before the mission to Mars with crew ever goes. And by that time, we may not know who the crew members will be. So it's very likely the crew preference items go away too, which leaves us down with the fact that I've got pre, um, the pre-positioned food, the pre-packaged food, and whatever we grow. So that just shows the importance of being able to grow fresh food and add to variety because as Shannon also mentioned, the food that's prepackaged has, from a nutritional perspective of shelf life, that for certain key nutrients, B vitamins, vitamin C, et cetera, uh, is not going to have the same efficacy over a potential two to three year mission as when it was uh, you know, supplied on the space station. So what we have to do is we have to buttress that nutritional gap that we're gonna be receiving. And the real challenge is it's gonna come at the end of the mission. You know, when the mission is returning with crews that have been gone away for such a long time, that's when they're gonna need those key nutrients the most. So what we're doing at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, at Kennedy Space Center not only is the launch center for all of our missions to space, but it's also a research center and where our primary focus is, is on plant growth, crop growth, and, and performance. Um, I did see a number of questions in the chat that I'd love to jump into and, and, and answer when, it, when it's appropriate. If we can't get them all today, Brad, you feel free to pass my email on to folks. Um, but let me go ahead and share a couple of slides real quick and I can talk about what our plans are for the future. So Brad, can you see what I'm presenting now? Yep, all good. Okay, so this just, as Shannon alluded to, is, is an overview of some of the plants and crop type plants that we've currently grown on Space Station. Uh, and as Shannon mentioned, we have two basic types of facilities from the US side that we grow our plants in. One is the advanced plant habitat. She showed a picture of it there. And the other are, is the veggie payload. And we actually have two veggie payloads now. Um, but what you can see and notice from all of these crops that I have on this, on this slide are that they're primarily and really all leafy green type crops. And the reason for that is because we basically don't have an ability to store or process and prepare any of these plants on orbit. 
Um, we only have a food warmer. We do not have a microwave oven. We don't have any for refrigeration facilities that we can use for food. So basically everything we grow has to be consumed before it would, would spoil, which is in a timeline similar to what we would have on Earth. So again, Shannon also alluded to the fact that most of these plants that we grow, only a portion, a relatively small portion, are consumed for food. The majority of it is sent back as part of the science research that these plants are supporting. Um, so fundamental to what we're doing is we're trying to ensure that we understand how plants grow optimally in the spaceflight environment. Uh, most people are probably aware that water does not behave the same way in space as it does on the ground. So getting water to the plants can be a challenge. Um, understanding the microbial load of what's going on as the plants grow is also a challenge because everything we grow, food safety is a number one priority for us. So we've we've certified all these plants and the processes that we grow them. So now the crews can actually start to consume some of them. But again, most of the material gets sent back to the researchers on the ground for investigation and analysis. Um, so I'm gonna jump to the second slide. I think that might be the most interesting. Um, while it's not a very pretty picture, it does kind of show a roadmap of where we're trying to go to. So on the lower left, you'll see everything begins with ground research. And that's what we do at the Kennedy Space Center. And that's where we have principal investigators across the country who come up with different science experiments. Uh, we fly those currently to the International Space Station, which is what you've seen and heard about mostly today. And now the future, where do we go from here? Well. As Shannon alluded to, it's not going to be just a, a continuation of growing plants and, and spending time and the care and maintenance of them, because when we first go back to the moon, we're going to be very challenged for, for mass to take to the moon and time for crews to work with plants on the moon. So the initial flights to the moon, as Shannon said, will be very much constrained to these high density caloric meals, uh, pre pre stored meals, things that will be more in line with the MREs, which we don't want the crews to have to rely on for long duration missions. But it'll be in the area of at the gateway in cis lunar space around the moon and on the lunar surface where we're going to start studying what do the effects of this new environment you know, impact on plants in terms of the radiation environment, growing things in partial gravity. We've experienced growing things in microgravity. How do we change our processes for this new environment? And then ultimately, as we start developing a more infrastructure on the moon, we will begin to develop a surface-based crop system. And that crop system will serve as an analog for what we take with us to Mars. And at some point in this transition to a Mars outpost, a Mars base, we'll be looking at moving and advancing our crop production from salad type of crops to also caloric replacement staple crops. But as we make that transition, we're going to have to keep in mind that it's going to require processing infrastructure. It's going to require more time potentially to grow those crops and to prepare them. So as we look at growing plants along this continuum and timeline, we're going to be looking at new technologies. How can we do things with automation, robotics? How can we engage AI, smart systems to grow and care the plants for us when I don't have as much crew time if crew is working on the surface of the moon or on the surface of Mars? So in that regard, NASA is also working with the terrestrial closed environment agriculture community, trying to leverage our expertise to also helpfully benefit how we grow crops on Earth in, in environments that are not necessarily conducive to traditionally growing plants in open field agriculture. So there's a real cross sharing of technology between controlled environment agriculture, what NASA is doing in space, and, and NASA is one of our main goals and objectives is always to look back on life on Earth and how do we make things better on Earth. And so we're really working when it comes to food to kind of do exactly that. Uh, so I think I've used up my time. I'll be glad to answer any questions whenever is appropriate, and I will um, turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. Um, yeah, there's a few questions I think you would probably great to answer. Um, I know one of the first one was, um, if you want to stop screen share, uh, do yeah, you know how long that her food stays fresh on the ISS? Like, um, there's, there's no difference between um, 
food staying fresh on the ISS than there would be uh, on the ground. The, the difference is in that we don't have a way to put it in a refrigerator, which may and, uh, obviously for on the ground um, enable longer shelf life of foods by actually putting them in something that cools them. Uh, it's, it's probably not commonly known. We don't have the ability to cook or to um, preserve food in a free refrigeration on space station. It's, yeah, so there it's was actually a question limited. about, could, could you barbecue in space? I think from a, a yeah, year I, three I, saw that one. <laughs> I think crews would be very happy if we could. But um, yeah, and one other thing that you mentioned that's very important is that psychological benefit. And that comes along with something like a barbecue. Um, food is, is one thing that we know that the people who are responsible for crew health do not really want to impact too severely because it has a very beneficial effect on crew morale. Yeah, interesting. Um, do, has there been any noticeable levels of higher radiation in some of the plants grown there? No, the, the, the plants don't store the radiation. I think the, the more interesting effect is going to be what is the radiation impact on plants and crew when I get past the magnetosphere of the Earth and I'm actually on the mission out to Moon or Mars. And the, the, the consensus is that if, if the crew members can handle the radiation, the plants very likely can. We have flown some seeds uh, on high altitude balloon flights in the Antarctic. We've sent some things up into space for longer periods of time, and we have noted some effect on the percentage of germination for certain seeds and some mutations in um, morphological aspects of plants, not necessarily in nutrition, nothing that would be harmful necessarily to eat, but you do see mutations that affect the morphology of certain leaves of plants that you can cull if, if you know you don't like the looks of them, etc. But that's something that when we start talking about lunar uh, exploration, Mars exploration, we really have to monitor the performance of those crops. And, and that's one of the first things we'll be looking at doing um, on some of our early Artemis missions. Interesting. Okay. Um, and, and what about gravity in some of the food growth? Do, is there any changes? Do they grow, I think someone said, do they grow taller? You know, is there any good noticeable difference with the fact of the microgravity environment? So I'm going to twist this a little bit and say <laughs> that plants grow in, in gravity um, and have developed a responses and mechanisms directly as a result of gravity. You have stalks and, and stems and things that fight against gravity. Um, and those are not necessarily part of the edible biomass. So what mm -hmm. we're actually trying to do is say, okay, now that I'm in, a in a, either a reduced gravity or a microgravity environment, do I need plants to have certain of that structure that's not edible, or can I re-engineer plants to produce more edible biomass and less of what's not needed because I'm in a reduced gravity environment? And that's really the way we're looking for the future is, is engineering the plants to be able to perform and provide the maximum edible biomass for the minimal amount of resources. Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting take on it, right? You know, trying to maximize it. And, and I may just ask this last question, and I think it's come in a couple different ways. I think someone has asked, what about veggie burgers? And this is uh, related to this other question from Nicholas. What about potentially lab-grown meats um, and right. how that may factor in? So, so let, me, let me say that where we are today, the emphasis is on crops, partly because of the quality of the nutrition they provide, the ease of, of growing them, um, but it's also the infrastructure around growing plants, even though there are facilities that are required that provide lighting and the right, the right um, environmental controls for plants, airflow, things like that. They're, they're relatively minor compared to what it would take to engineer uh, meats or engineer plants in such a way as they would appear to be as meat. So that's down the road. It's, mm -hmm. We just don't have the volume. We don't have the resources to be able to support that infrastructure at this point in time. As you can see from those pictures, just getting small spaces to be able to grow plants in is a challenge as well. Yeah. And, and I, wrote, I guess, sorry, last question, I promise. But someone asked this before, did, you know, things like Mir and Skylab do this or has growing only been on the ISS? No, the, it goes back. To, it goes back to Skylab and, and Mir and, and earlier space flights. Uh, if you look at the history of plants in space, uh, actually, some of the early writers back at the turn of the 20th century who are talking about space travel, you know, already, and this was a case certainly for a, a famous Russian author, included growing plants for the mission as part of the process mm. by which you would feed crews. So, it, 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 even you can go back further. If you look back early exploration when explorers came from Europe 
and went to the, to the North America. They brought with them plants. When, when explorers go to the Antarctic, you know, you look at the early polar missions, same kind of thing. And there's one other thing, if I could have just a question to answer that I saw that I, I, I didn't want to um, bypass. The question was, what do we grow the plants in? Yeah. Um, and there is a media that we use, it's called arsalite. It's like a baked clay. Um, and we use that both in advanced plant habitat and in veggie. And here is the real challenge that we're working on now when it comes to growing plants for the future. Uh, both veggie and APH, the systems we grow it in, um, that material is used for one grow out and then it has to be discarded. So what am I doing? I'm bringing up essentially the equivalent of soil and I'm using it once. There's a weight penalty, as we all know, if you've gone to the local stores and bought soil um, and then you have to discard it. So what we're trying to do now is to really focus our efforts on hydroponic systems that don't necessarily require a media. It's definitely something that's not disposable. And hopefully we're actually working with some researchers looking at potential hydroponic solutions that will work regardless of the gravity environment um, by capillary action, contact angles, surface systems, wetting of different surfaces. We're looking at ways we can use basically the same growing approach, whether I'm in unit gravity on the Earth, microgravity on the International Space Station, or partial gravity on the Moon and Mars. And that will greatly reduce the amount of, you know, non-sustainable resources we would have to bring. The whole thing that we're looking for is sustainability. Yeah. And again, when it comes to that, there's this, you know, kickback to Earth, because what we grow on Earth has to be sustainable, too. Oh, that's amazing. Um, well, thank you very much. And, and again, we'll, Ralph will come back at the end when we, we all have a, a few chats. Um, and, and what Ralph said actually relates perfectly into what our next speaker is going to talk about, Dacu, uh, Dr. Jacob Humpel. Uh, Ralph mentioned a little bit about the effort as kind of automation, and exact, that's exactly what Ralph, uh, sorry, Jacob, uh, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Southern Queensland, is working on. So he's at the Center for Agriculture Engineering, and uh, the team he's part of is trying to develop automated plant monitoring systems uh, to grow plants in space. And so this is actually a project that's been funded by the Australian Space Agency. Um, and so he has a background in machine automation. Uh, and vision systems for detecting plant stress in the labs. Uh, and so critical to what Ralph was just talking about. And so Jacob's gonna share a bit about what uh, they're doing up at USQ. Uh, so take it away, Jacob. Thanks, Brad. Um, hi, everyone. So let me share my screen here um, and get into this. So, um, we can kind of move past the slides. Brad did a good job introducing um, what we're doing here. So this sorry, project you, is- Sorry, sorry. Jacob, you just want to flip it. I think we're on your uh, presenter. Oh, wrong screen? Yeah, that's right, yeah, 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 yeah. All good. Oh, that's all right. There we go. Try it again. <laughs> uh, it's good to see your second slides as well, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Perfect, thank you. That's looking better? Perfect. Okay, so um, yeah, this is a uh, part of a project funded through uh, the Australian Space Agency um, that actually uh, came to be through some collegial discussions uh, with Ralph, actually, so and, and some some folks at NASA. So to try and line this up with what they want for the future, while uh, bringing Australia into it as well, um, in parallel. So the problem um, that we need to solve is that uh, growing plants in space, it provides for food safety and security, as we discussed already tonight, uh, or, or wherever you are. Um, yet plant monitoring for stress detection is not currently automated to maybe the level that could be desirable or would be desirable. And so, I mean, taking a step back is why plants, and I think we've done a good job already tonight of discussing this, but it's to meet the metabolic and nutrition needs, as, as Shannon and Ralph said, and uh, including the vitamin loss when you start going for uh, longer duration missions. Um, and the resupply break-even points um, versus weight versus cost to ship more food out there, um, as well as to maintain uh, systems with increased uh, calm lag, which Shannon mentioned. Um, there's a lot of communication back with Earth, and there's a lot of experts there that are great at uh, agronomists and growing plants, um, but that's not really astronauts' primary job up there. So if we can introduce some automation into the system um, to, to take over some of that, uh, that would be ultimately uh, beneficial to everyone. So our mission goal is really to provide that software um, for the automatic detection of plant stress and space flights is the first step towards uh, 
full system automation for plant growth. And so that would consist of the software that performs autonomous plant monitoring, um, both to detect nutrient water and pathogen stress. Um, there's been some, some pathogen issues, very minor, but in azaneas, I think, so fusarium on the space station in the past, um, as well as to, as I mentioned, enable further, further automation in the future uh, with deployment goals, both to um, low Earth orbit, uh, as well as to the moon and uh, beyond. And I guess, Here's kind of the, the reverse of what we're talking about with Ralph is um, as much as NASA wants to, um, and uh, a lot of research in, in space wants to be able to adapt that research back to Earth, there's some research on Earth that can be adapted to space. Um, so on farm, there's a lot of machine vision technologies that are already in use because you have to manage large areas while optimizing inputs to keep profitable and, and feed as many people as possible. And some of those technologies uh, include things like GPS guidance, satellite imagery, and yield maps, um, as well as um, spectral reflectance. So this can be, this is looking at um, different uh, bands of light or colors of light is a way to think about it, um, and how those interact with, with surfaces. So there's a, they call it a special vegetation index called NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and that was actually developed by NASA. Um, but that looks at how red and near infrared light, um, a ratio that interacts with a plant um, to provide a greenness factor, which it correlates to um, how healthy a plant is. Um, and so there's, there's hundreds of these reflectance indices that have been developed on Earth that could be adapted for space. And some other interesting technologies that are just um, coming on the horizon are machine vision based or uh, deep learning, machine learning uh, based, like weed spot spraying. Um, for things like uh, green on green precision uh, application of herbicides um, and just using some of those technologies that aren't just focused on, on color and some of the more basic uh, uh, variables to identify um, plant stresses. So some of the applied research areas we can use is machine vision um, that are already ongoing is looking at things like plant height, um, which uh, as opposed to looking at a ruler with camera, you can use things like a uh, depth sensor or a LIDAR um, as well as we can look at things like disease detection, which is one of the goals of this project, um, including pre-visual disease detection. So with the goal of detecting these, these problems before we would know that they exist, to intervene as early as possible and reduce the amount of any intervention necessary. Um, another one that's on Earth that will hopefully not be as big of an issue, um, especially on the International Space Station, but potentially in the future, is things like weed detection. Um, and just automating measurements like uh, there's current phone applications um, that have been developed at the Center for Agricultural Engineering here at USQ uh, for things like pest scouting. So just automating measurements of counting pests on leaves or insects on leaves, which, which can take a lot of time, but those can be adapted towards um, counting lesions and um, further things for um, plant stress detection and plant monitoring in space. Some of the analysis techniques that we currently use that are what we call more uh, traditional machine vision would be textures, so that could be how leaves interact with each other in the canopy, because that will vary depending on the stress level, as well as color. Is the plant green? Is it yellow? Is it brown? And how is it fast? Is it changing? And in shape as well. So is it pitted from a disease or, or insect damage, or are they, the leaves starting to curl in or wilt? I and mean, could that be a nutrient or um, potentially a water, water issue? An emerging uh, technique that you see that um, is all over the literature today is, is something called deep learning, which in a nutshell, I won't go too far into it, is using computers to look into large data uh, sets. So these could be images um, or other data streams and to pull out um, patterns that the human uh, can't really recognize or aren't read, readily identifiable and using that to increase our understanding of the, the interactions. And some of the ways we do that here at the center uh, through different types of sensors, um, color sensors, which would be something like on your cell phone camera, which is a, similar to a human eye, red, green, blue. Um, thermal sensors, uh, differences being hot and cold, there's thermometer, but um, where each section of the image, so each individual pixel um, is a, a temperature reading. And believe it or not, plants can get fevers too if they're stressed, uh, just like humans, um, as well as depth distance measurements. So this, um, a lot of the, the depth sensors have been used on things like self-driving cars or self-driving rovers, but they can also be used to identify um, and track plant 
growth speeds and heights and things like that. And probably one of the more interesting ones is the multispectral um, imagers, which divide the light into many different regions. And that'd be something like the NDVI discussed uh, previously. But um, in these different regions of light, plant molecules can actually reflect light differently um, because they are uh, each region can be correspond to different uh, molecular compounds in the plant, and those can respond to stresses um, and change the composition, which in turn means that the multispectral signatures, so the, the images we get, uh, will will change um, as the plant responds to a disease. So that's another technology we we are looking at using. And a, a big thing is how does farm di or farm versus space habitats? How are they different? We do a lot of work in farm habitats here at the center. Um, well, space is highly controlled, especially on the International Space Station, which has um, some more potential for lab experiments, more like controlled environment um, agriculture, as Ralph mentioned, um, whereas a farm has a larger area and some more genetic variability, as well as increased exposure to pathogens and weather, which we don't get on the space station. Um, but in the end, what we want to know is, is something wrong? and Can we determine what's wrong? So a simple output's required in both cases, and that's what we're here to um, provide. So our components, what we're actually going to do is ground experiments in a controlled environment chamber uh, through robotics and machine vision, and those are currently ongoing. Um, in a few plants, both uh, leafy greens, uh, which is the staple, as well as um, some grains, which Ed Ralph had mentioned are going to be a staple in the future, um, potentially on uh, planetary surfaces or lunar surfaces. Um, and we're going to develop launch ready software. So that means it can be ported to the International Space Station uh, to the current habitats uh, if desired. And um, that just will consist of the automated algorithms, which were determined um, off of uh, which, which systems worked best and developed uh, through our ground based experiments and a user interface for ease of use. So the astronaut shouldn't have to uh, talk to ground as much. The, the system should provide them with an idea of what's going on and how to remediate that, uh, as well as. We'll provide a spec for um, what camera sensors with a, the desirable out, output, excuse me, is to um, use the camera sensors that are currently, currently available. But if there are some that have potential to work better, we want to know that as well. And I think that's that's all I had for a presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions now or, or during the panel, um, Brad. And anyone can email me as well. This should be recording, so. Great. Now, um, uh, Payne asked quite an interesting question. Um, you know, you said you want to detect weeds, but potentially weeds, many of them could actually be edible and, you know, they're fast growing um, and yep. sometimes the first ones to devastate, you know, is there any thought about how that can be incorporated into usefulness rather than just detecting them? Yeah, so um, with the, the vision technology, um, if we can detect them, it doesn't mean we have to spray them. That means we can monitor them just like we would any other um, a desirable crop. Um, now that might be going over to the more of the biology side and or my agronomic background and figuring out which which weeds are actually edible. Something like a dandelion is very edible, um, which we would spray in the field. Um, but figuring out which one of those have that highest uh, nutrient and cal caloric, excuse me, content, um, I suppose, and then just adapting our algorithms to work with those. So really the goal is to provide a, a generic al set of algorithms that works uh, very precisely, but not to the degree that it needs to be tuned for every plant we want to grow. Because if that's, it's it's really just it's an unending project, and um, yeah, uh, yeah, we don't want to go there. So, um, and and, I, and one question, um, someone asked quite earlier, and I think it's quite apt. And and actually, Ralph even slightly brought this issue up. Now yeah. is you know, how do you know this technology? how you know do you see uses for it here on earth i mean i assume the answer is yes um but you know has, has there been any thought or do you have any ideas about how that could quickly be adapted or ways it could be adapted here on earth oh for sure so any of these um these technologies that are developed in specifically a uh, controlled environment for for a controlled environment in space can immediately be adapted to controlled environment agriculture and vertical agriculture um and then moving into you know, your glasshouse agriculture where you start to increase variability and then adapting those algorithms further and seeing how they perform in a field environment, whether that be mounting on a spray boom as it goes through the field and monitoring throughout the season, um, or if it's a, uh, a sentinel station in the field, uh, which we've done some research on in the past, and we have ongoing research as, as well in, in spray applications and just monitoring plants 
um, in general, um, off of drones or, or equipment or things like that. Um, but there is increased variability in the field. So this is a good first step that then when this works perfectly in space, we can bring it back and start introduce more, introduce more of those variables as in, you know, different soil types, different um, diseases. So in space, maybe we have a handful that we know have become an issue in the past, they're pretty rare. Um, but on Earth, you don't know what you're going to deal with between seasons. So it's starting to in include that into your data. So. Interesting. Um, yes, it, well, when we come back, we'll, we'll have a few more I think we'll talk about. And, you know, you, you touch on a few issues that I think our, our next panelist um, will, will fit into, and that's uh, Dr. Caitlin Burt, who's uh, an Australian Research Council uh, Future Fellow uh, at ANU, and she's an ANU Institute for Space Mission Specialist. Uh, based in the research school of biology. So Caitlin's lab works on and tests uh, membrane transport proteins called aquaporins. Um, so, you know, they have key roles in helping cells adjust their environment. Um, and they're used uh, inside filters to turn bodily waste into drinking water in space, which may be the question you always wanted to ask, but never did. Caitlin is the person to answer that question. Uh, and I will pass it over to her. Thank you. Um, and is this showing correctly? Yes, perfect, thanks. Awesome. So to get us going, what's the first thing that comes into your mind when you think about what is needed for life in space? You might be gasp thinking about air, that's intuitive. But one of the most important ingredients that we've talked about today, of course, might actually be water. So there was a stage when Earth didn't host life. And the presence of liquid water on Earth was critical for enabling life to evolve here. And it's possible that there's in the order of 5 million cubic kilometres of water on up Mars, but it's frozen and life really likes liquid water. So liquid water was essential for the evolution of life on Earth, but life also needed membranes and membrane transporters to be able to compartmentalize and control the essential chemical reactions that are needed to generate useful energy to sustain life. So membrane transport is very important for life on Earth and for life to survive traveling into space. And during the evolution of life on Earth, single-celled life forms came first, of course, before multicellular life, but we need to remember that higher life remains very dependent on microbial life. So tonight, we'll talk a bit more about water, about membrane transport, and about taking really useful microbes into space. So those are the key three items that are all important resources that we'll need as part of our luggage as we depart for longer term space travel. So water first up. It's heavy, so that means it costs a lot to transport it into space. Um, and Ralph could probably tell you the latest values, but at some stage it was costing in the order of $250,000 per day to supply each astronaut with their required around 11 litres of water. So the astronauts have to take their bodily waste liquids and put it through a filter, which um, you're watching some work on this in one of the photos here, and recycle around 93 to 94% of the wastewater. So the original filtration devices that we use to try and achieve this on space missions were relatively heavy and only lasted a short time relative to the cost of sending them up there. And they sometimes failed to remove some of the contaminants. But inspired by the function of a type of water channel protein called an aquaporin that's present in human kidneys, a new technology was developed by NASA for water filtration. So your kidneys filter uh, in the order of 170 litres of liquids of water in your bodies per day, and your human aquaporin proteins are a critical part of this function. So NASA, along with a company um, that's actually called Aquaporin, uh, came up with these amazing aquaporin-based water filters. So some aquaporins can transport in the order of 4 billion water molecules per second and exclude everything else. And the type of technology um, that was built using this has been spun off into fancy under the sink units and US Army use shipping container size units 
to supply remote serving troops with fresh water from dirty water. And all of the units do this. They take mixed complex waste solutions and they isolate water and the rest of the molecules in the input solution remains in an undifferentiated waste output. So our research team um, at the Australian National University are uh, working on engineering the function of aquaporins and that's for two applications. So one application involves advancing these types of membrane separation technologies and the other application is adapting crop plants to really challenging environments. So what we've done is we've built components that can be used in similar technologies to what you're looking at here, but our components enable a new capability where the devices can also extract other valuable molecules like nutrients from wastewater. So the nutrients currently being lost in the waste can instead be reused as a valuable resource for growing plants. And we also study and manipulate how plants use their own aquaporins to adjust to different environmental stresses. So this information can help inform how we engineer crop plants to cope with the environments that they'll experience when growing in space and when adapting to climate change here on Earth. So advancing membrane separation technologies in space creates the type of technologies that we need to address water security challenges on Earth. So the units that we're working on are designed to enable exceptional water and resource recycling. They're useful on space missions and they'll be useful for purposes such as supplying reliable access to clean water during natural disaster events or extreme drought events on Earth. So aquaporins are important for the function of living cells from all kingdoms of life when those life forms are adjusting to the conditions in space. So medical studies of water transmembrane transport in human nervous and testicular cultured cells in low gravity conditions revealed that after 30 minutes at low gravity, aquaporins are significantly upregulated in all the cell type study. So profiling of the gene expression in some pea seedlings grown in microgravity conditions in space also revealed aquaporin upregulation. So these studies indicate that aquaporins are extremely useful in challenging environments such as low gravity environments. But plants have been successfully grown in the low atmospheric pressures associated with microgravity. Plant cells, um, as Ralph mentioned, they manage their own internal solutes to create their own pressure called turga, and they have cell walls that give them strength. So plants can use their internal signaling mechanisms to control their turga and their cell wall properties and define the shape that their roots and shoots grow into. So they're not dependent on gravity to achieve this. They respond to gravity, but gravity isn't a dependency that they require for their growth. And plants are great at adapting to growing in, in environments with very varying levels of external pressure. So there are seagrasses that grow deep under the water and seagrasses have been observed at depths around like 30 metres. So the pressure um, increases about one atmosphere for every 10 metres of water depth. So they're growing where there could be a pressure around 42 psi down there relative to standard atmospheric pressure at sea level around 15 psi. And of course, there are mosses that grow way up on Mount Everest, around 6,000 metres above sea level, where air pressure could be just 7 psi. So I, I understand on the International Space Station, there might be a partial pressure of oxygen to maintain around 3 psi, um, and that plants would be perfectly happy in those conditions. So let's move on to the micro passengers, which has come up a few times in the questions about um, both pathogens and then also about the opportunities to take microbes to space for various engineering purposes. So micro passengers are inevitable and a necessary um, passenger on space missions. So plants and animals can benefit from enormously from the activities, activities of um, symbiotic microbes in helping them uh, access nutrients. And of course, pathogens can be big problems. So we need to take the components of, of microbes, that, the populations that benefit us, not the ones that do harm and keep them happy too. But of course, space lacks a natural population of symbiotic microbes. So to access the benefits of those symbiotic relationships, we need to supply those um, to the growing environments in space. Uh, and it's likely that over time we'll be able to determine which plants and microbes work best together to be most productive in the particular conditions that they'll experience in space, which means that this is an area of, of research that it's expected to grow, lots of great projects to do in figuring out the optimal space microbes. 
So space is an environment that of course lacks the key resources needed to propagate plants. So the only water and nutrient and microbial resources available are those ones that we bring with us. Um, and this means space travel involves being extremely efficient with resources and it's advantageous to recycle and reuse. And of course, recycling and reusing resources is something we also need to do better on Earth to meet our sustainability challenges and look after our planet. But fortunately, the amazing types of technologies that are being uh, developed to help us recycle resources in space can also help us do a better job of recycling resources in, on Earth. So if anyone's um, currently studying and um, interested in uh, joining um, teams working on this, we're just about to advertise about 20 PhD projects. So um, you're welcome to get in touch and um, thanks for listening. No, thanks. Uh, well, just a tad of work to do, it sounds like. Um, <laughs> just so I was actually asked, um, how does the cost of these aquaporin filters compare to what's currently available on Earth? Well, that's a great question. So there's so many different ways that you can filter things. And, and one of the great um, perks of this type of filter is that you're actually using microbes as a, as a workforce to generate the components that go into it. And so that gives them a good cost advantage relative to some of the other types of technologies where um, it's you know actually right, requires sort of man-made effort to synthesize all the parts. So you've got a little workforce building it for you um, and delivering it to you. I mean, in nature, of course, plants filter around uh, a quarter of the entire world's precipitation every single year. So you know there's a great advantage to being able to use other living organisms to help with those purposes. Oh, interesting. And, and and you touched on this, obviously, and, you know, I know a few people are talking about bacteria and that sort of thing. And, you know, as you said, it, it finds its way. So do you know if there's any differences in diseases between this technique and what would be on space and compared to Earth? Or are they the same or that sort of thing? Well, one of the key emerging, um, emerging pieces of information is that where you've got, if you've got a sterile environment, um, and then you get one type of microbe in, then it can kind of take over. So you sort of need a, a population of microbes to keep any given microbe in check. So, so, so a microbe that could be your friend in one environment could be a problem in another environment. So I, that challenge for researchers means that you need to gather together um, multiple populations of microbes that where that combination together actually becomes um, uh, an advantage. So uh, being able to understand that is going to help us both in making sure that we can optimise how we function in space and, and things like we mentioned earlier of, of, of generating the right uh, nutrition um, for long space trips. But it's, it's also going to help us down here because we do a lot of things where we harm uh, microbes through our general practices that could be useful to us down here. So understanding it's going to be a really big advance. Yeah, it sounds like it. And and, and Grant has asked, these filters, are, are they recyclable or, or reusable? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, they're they're quite long lasting, but then when in the context of building them all, um, you can reincorporate new components because it's living cells building those components for you to insert in there. Interesting. Um, well, thank you very much. And, and again, we'll have a few more at the end when we all come back. And I'm going to hand it over to now our, our last speaker, Julio Hernandez. And he's going to come a bit from a different approach in the sense that we, you know, we heard from Shannon in the beginning about dealing with the stuff on space. And, and there's, as everyone has now talked about, this looking at what we're going to do onto the moon and Mars. And Julio uh, has been one of these people of trying to practice the techniques of how are you going to do it on Mars? So uh, Julio is a PhD candidate at Purdue uh, in Indiana, uh, a state I'm familiar with. I lived in there, there uh, for a while uh, at the School of Aeronautical and Astronautical Engineering. So he's working on novel methods for sustainability of space systems. Um, so he has a, he's, one of his goals is to advance human exploration um, through sustainable efforts in engineering, agriculture, infrastructure on the moon and Mars. Now, he actually also served as a crew botanist on a simulated Mars mission called the Mars Desert Research Station. Uh, and he hopes to one day follow in the footsteps of his father, who also made his way onto space, NASA astronaut 
uh, Jose Hernandez, who was on the space shuttle Discovery. So really kind of completing this cycle of where we are talking about quite literally now to where we talk about going to in the end. Um, and uh, Julio will talk about it. So I'll hand it over to him. <laughs> Thank you, Brad, for the wonderful introduction. I uh, Good morning or uh, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, seeing that it's early morning here in Indiana, uh, I have myself a nice cup of tea and I'm so excited to be here and feel very honored to be uh, invited to speak on this webinar. Uh, without further, further uh, interruptions or a delay, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, all right. So how do you could you just make it full screen real quick? Uh, yes, I forgot to do that. No, it's all right. Oh, Oops. Of course. Yes. it's the wrong screen. That's all right. Look, <laughs> to, to be fair for people who don't know, uh, Julio had to wake up around 4.30 a.m. local time, his local time, to join us. So, uh, you know, if anyone performs this well at this early, more power to you. Perfect. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Brad, for, for being so kind to me. I really appreciate it. So anyway, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. My name is Julio Hernandez, and I'm a PhD candidate at Purdue University here in Indiana in USA. Um, I, my specific field of study is actually in aeronautical and astronautical engineering. And my research area pertains to structural health monitoring, non-destructive evaluation of critical components for sp space flight hardware. So protecting our engineering assets uh, while they're in transit into space and while they're in transit to their end all destination. And I have an interest in, in not only providing uh, a sustainable way to protect our engineering assets, but also now looking at it from the, from the perspective of once we have constructed our spacecraft and we've learned how to protect the equipment on them, uh, now that we are considering putting humans on there for much longer duration space missions, how do we protect the human and how do we provide enough nutrition and food for the humans so that for humans so that they can, you know, do their job and, you know, not only work and live in space, but also thrive. So to give you a little introduction about myself, my hometown is in Lodi, California. It's uh, just south of Sacramento, of uh, uh, Sacramento in California. I'm first slash second generation Mexican American, and my family comes from a background of being field workers. So food production and agriculture agriculture is actually very close to home to me, seeing that my parents and my grandparents were actually out there picking the fields. And so it's now that I'm in grad school, trying to advance this field of technology to uh, to provide agricultural uh, support to astronauts up in space, kind of like closes the loop, at least within within my generation. And that's mainly inspired because I have an interest in human space exploration. Like Brad had said earlier, my dad was actually an astronaut. He flew up on SDS-128 on USS Discovery in, I believe, 2009. And that was a two-week mission up to the International Space Station, delivering cargo supplies, experiments, and additional uh, personnel up to the station. Uh, and my research area is like what I said before, it's more from the material science side of for for developing new materials for spacecraft, but also have the interest in agricultural systems for space in the space environment. So hopefully within the short term, I finish my PhD and I'm able to work in the, one of these research areas so I can continue to further advance the state of art and maybe at the end of my career, become a professor or a high school teacher, we'll see. Uh, so, a lot of what we have to do with space or a lot of the work that goes up into uh, a lot of work that we have to to advance technologies for space applications is about us being very proactive about looking at the problem and trying to come up with solutions before we encounter the problem them ourselves in that environment. As we know, space is a very dangerous environment and there's little, little to no room for for error. But 
innovation sometimes requires trial and error. Uh, but in space, failure is usually very expensive. And when there's a human involved in, in, in the mission, most likely and shouldn't be an option. So how do you prepare humanity for going up into space? Well, experience is the best teacher in this case. So we have to simulate the type of environment that we expect to experience up in space or in that environment, you know, either in a space station environment, in a cislunar environment, either on the surface or orbiting around that, uh, over, orbiting around the planetoid or going to Mars and beyond. Uh, we have to simulate the expected conditions that we predict we will experience once we're there. And when we look at Mars and beyond, uh, a lot of that has to deal with isolation, confinement, ex the extreme environment, and having very limited resources. What you bring is what you got, unless you're able to make more of it while, while you're there. So we need to be prepared to live and work in space for long durations. And the pictures on the right side of my screen, the top one is actually of, of me and some of my crewmates being analog astronauts at the Mars Desert Research Station. So this is a station in which simulates what it would be like to live in an environment that's very similar to, to being on Mars. And this isn't just something that space enthusiasts do. Astronauts themselves do this as well. In the picture down below is actually of, of astronaut candidates in NEMO, which is a simulated environment uh, uh, off the coast of the Florida Keys, in which astronauts live in a pressure ambient pressure vessel capsule underwater, and they live and work in that environment to simulate what it would be like to live and work on in an international space station. We're doing EVAs and doing extravehicular activities. Uh, they're doing it in scuba suits where they're neutrally buoyant. So they're simulating what it would be like to experience working in zero G, uh, as well as having the confined space and isolation being underwater and the limited resources of only having enough food and water uh, that you initially brought in for the entire duration of your expedition. So even astronauts are actually training in these environments so that they are well prepared to not only work and live in these environments, but also thrive in these environments. And to give a little bit of a bigger picture to, to the experience that I had at the Mars Desert Research Station, this is a full station picture of the station itself where here is a two-story habitat module, which is based on Dr. Subrin's direct mission, to direct Mars uh, outline, which they, in his, in his uh, book, what he had expected was that you would launch a, a ha all the equipment that you need on top of a rocket. And uh, one, one segment of the rocket itself would actually be the habitat itself. So that, that explains the cylindrical shape of, of the habitat in which that they would transit that the entire habitat hole to Mars, land it, and that would be the initial habitat uh, that will be the base for, for astronauts, or at least the first settlers on Mars, to start expanding the settlement out to provide the facilities that, that we need. Uh, to give an example of some facilities that we do have here is that we have an engineering base, so any tools or equipment that you need for your expedition is located here. You have your greenhouse, you have your science dome, so any scientific technical equipment is, is located here, as well as two observatories. One is a manually controlled observatory, another one is a remote controlled observatory, one that you can actually connect to once you've been trained to remotely from anywhere around the world and be able to monitor conduct astronomy experiments remotely uh using from this location here in the utah desert as well as having your power system and a backup uh generator to provide your power but the thing is is that going to these analog stations is not just like a weekend camp out trip uh, you actually have to do in, do a lot of work while you're there, you bring in your own experiments. And for myself, I brought in a botany experiment, which I investigated what it would be like 
uh, bringing in an initial amount of, of earth soil and cutting it with, with some of the surrounding regolith around the area. And regolith is basically, you know, rocks, minerals, absence of, of any organic matter. And the idea is, is that rather than bring everything that you need to set up an agricultural system, you bring a portion of it and then you utilize what you have to expand your agricultural capabilities once you're there because the turnaround times to get supplies to, to Mars is considerable. But this isn't the only analog station out there. MDRS is a great facility. It has its own unique challenges uh, that participants have to overcome, but it's not the only one out there. There's actually several many out there around the world. And before I entered this community, it, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of how extensive the, the, the effort and investment was to prepare us to actually go out into space. And here are just a few of the analog stations around the world, some in the US, some in, in Europe, one in, in Russia as well, even one in Israel, which is another Mars analog station. Uh, and then the first one ever is Habitat Mark, first one in the Southern Hemisphere, Habitat Marte. So even these analog stations are starting to become more accessible to different communities and environments and uh, uh, around the world. And so analog stations offer a variety of, of environments and unique challenges to prepare us for long-term settlements in, in space. And some of these are, 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 are uh, owned and and administered by some space agencies and others are actually uh, administered or managed by some civilian uh so, some civilian entities such as the mars society and for mdrs so people like us who are not astronauts can actually go out there and participate in these analog expeditions. If you're considering pursuing a, a career to become an astronaut yourself, this is a good way to, to see if you can not only live and work, but also thrive in these environments before you get thrown into the deep end uh, if, if you get accepted to, to be an astronaut after the competitive process. But going back into going back into the main topic at hand is sustainability in space. To me, in my perspective, there's there's two main factors that we have to consider: the engineering factor and the and the human factor. For the engineering factor, this is my bread and butter for my graduate work, in which I'm developing technology to protect our engineering assets. And what does that mean is that, well, trying to make sure that wherever we put up into space can operate in space for as long as possible, or at least for its entire operational lifespan, protect this equipment and possibly even biological life, humans itself, and quickly identify any damage or in critical systems and provide prognosis for residual life. But here's the critical part is that if we want to go out into space ourselves, we have to consider in what, what factors directly impact us. So our psycholog psychological needs, space is a stressful environment, so we need to manage our stress in this environment, as well as maintain a connection back to home and earth, uh, home or earth. Uh, and then on top of that, basis basic physiological needs such as having a breathable environment, you know, right atmosphere composition, water, not only for consumption, but for hygiene and other needs. And then big thing, which is the focus of, of this webinar is nutrition, but then also exercise to make sure that our bodies remain strong while we're in these low G micro G environments. So there are some special considerations that we have to have when we're trying to have uh, provide food in space and on planetoids such as uh, such as the moon and other small bodies around the solar system is that providing nutrition to astronauts is as much of a is as much of a engineering challenge as it is more of a human challenge such as their launch limitations volume and mass space is limited on on rockets the environment that we that these uh, agricultural systems are going to be in uh, may may suit itself to be 
may may favor one one way to uh, produce ag, uh, plants or in food over another, such as zero G or low G environments, and then and then the costs of the system itself. We have to be very cost conscious uh, about these. So there's different approaches to this. We could provide nutrition using uh, dried or stabilized food, and this train of thought usually goes along the lines of you you supply everything that you need right from the very beginning. Uh, but you don't have any way to 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 provide more food unless there were a resupply mission, or you can go into the second train of thought is that if you have some development on the side to to provide some agricultural uh, capabilities, you could employ hydroponics, aquapron aquaponics, or other traditional farming techniques to produce some food as you're going through the through the expedition or through the mission but you can't forget the human factor either uh, we have to make sure that whatever food that we do provide provides the right nutrition and enough of it to sustain our astronauts in space so that they can fulfill their mission avoid food fatigue so they're not eating the same thing over and over and over and as one of our speakers had said earlier texture can be a very important consideration uh, as well as psychologically having some comfort food thrown in there, something that reminds you from home can be incredibly important, uh, as well as the variety between having hot and cold meals and additionally eating fresh food. And all these technologies, while they're being developed for, for space applications, they also have some applications here on Earth uh, for, for us so that we can provide, possibly provide even higher density agricultural production with a lower footprint. Uh, and on the right hand side is a little small hydroponics experiment that we took to MDRS, which we, we were growing some, some onions and some tomatoes, uh, in, in nutrient enhanced water. And, um, just to give it a little bit of a picture of what it looks on the inside. This is just our, our living room. And I was the unofficial chef for, for, the, for the crew. So I was the one that actually cooked most of the meals for the entire expedition. And I am very passionate, in, uh, passionate about cooking. So it was a real challenge trying to cook with dehydrated food. And one thing that I had to learn is I had to be very conscious of how much water I use for cooking because, well, there's only so much that, that we had. And finally, this is just an alternative picture of the Mars as a research station from the opposite view. While we were out on an EVA, you can see that the environment itself look, very much looks as if we were on Mars. Um, and that's it that I have for, for this presentation. And I'll be more than happy to, to answer any of your questions. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have anything specific to this, this to discuss. Um, yeah, th thanks, Julio. Uh, Colby is actually asking if you could travel to any planet, which one would you choose and why? <laughs> that is a very, very good question. I think I would love to travel to to Mars simply because that's really hot right now. And, <laughs> you know, the Mars is, is just like, is the pie in the sky right now for for humans to go to but traveling to jupiter may be also very interesting to be able to see the flow of the gases within its atmosphere with your own eyes mm. sometimes if you've seen the pictures of 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 jupiter especially the high resolutions ones it's just mind-boggling astounding and fantastic oh i liked it yeah yeah um uh, the 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 movement of of the gas on Jupiter I think is uh, always great, and, and actually from some of these analogs, someone says, and it kind of relates. So, do you think on some of these future missions, I guess in particular Mars, maybe the Moon, do you think that you'll end up that with someone who potentially is primarily a botanist or a nutritional specialist rather than maybe some of the other fields? You know, do you do you see this as being really identified? expertise needed in some of these longer duration missions? That's, that's a very good question, Brad. And I really appreciate it because it's, it, the, the missions, the crews who are selected for these expeditions 
uh, are selected based on their skills and the, their capabilities. Uh, so initially, at least initially, the people who are going to be going to, to, to back to the moon and Mars and even beyond are going to be very highly specialized. And so there might be an individual who is solely dedicated to handling all the agricultural system, be a dedicated botanist, but NASA and other space agencies love redundancies. So they're going to train that individuals to understand all the other components and safety systems or systems for their, for their, uh, of their spacecraft and of their mission for safety's sake. But that doesn't mean that space is only limited to the experts. Mm. What we're seeing nowadays is that we're starting to open up space more and more to the regular person. Interesting. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, stop sharing. I'll have all the panelists turn on. I know we're a little bit over time. Sorry, but there's a few really good questions. I think that'd be great for everyone. Um, and this is something that a lot of people have asked. And, and Julio, as you drink, it's perfectly on cue. What do you do about tea and coffee in space? Now, we've heard that there's really no heating. Uh, I think we everyone could agree some sort of tea or coffee is probably going to be critical to future exploration, even nowadays. So how do you go about solving that problem? Anyone? Ralph, is there anything that NASA is working on to, to get a <laughs> hot cup of joe, as they say? So you're, you're getting outside of my area of experience <laughs> and expertise, but I, I would assume that, that tea and coffee would um, store fairly well. I haven't heard anyone um, complaining about um, uh, us not looking into that. So I, I would have to default to the food system folks at the Johnson Space Center um, for anything more than that. I, I can possibly add on to this because I asked this question to my dad once okay, uh, yeah. be, uh, when he went up is that for, for micro G environments, it's very important that any liquids that you consume are in a closed container. So any tea or any coffee that, that you're going to drink, it's probably going to be either pre-packaged or, you know, not going to be in an open container because that liquid may possibly you know, go up into the air and possibly damage any of the electronic systems. But that's not to say that, you know, a creature comfort like tea or coffee isn't going to be necessary. <laughs> mm. And well, I guess you could, you could assume that the issue of that would be a little bit different than on, on so, say, the Mars, Mars, where there is a decent amount of gravity. So, mm -hmm. let, Brad, let me jump in yeah. that um, there actually have been updates. If you, anybody can go online on YouTube and search for a cappuccino uh, on space station. Um, there is a researcher that we work with at Portland State. Uh, his name is Dr. Mark Wise logo and he actually designed for one of the Italian astronauts who didn't want to think drink her cappuccino um, out of a closed you know container a, a cup that is actually now rated as having levels of containment that is open and you can drink and sip right out of it. Mm. There's actually a video where she tosses this cup, with liquid in it and it's rotating and the liquid stays in it. And basically that's the, the nature of contact angles and surface tensions, capillary forces. And it's that exact same type of um, you know, technology we're trying to incorporate in hydroponic plant watering systems that I can take into any gravity field. So there are efforts you know, in things that might seem implausible just 10 years ago or 15 years ago, Julio, when your dad flew, that we're <laughs> actually working around now. So. Um, you know, very interesting. Well, I think it's amazing just to see how fast, you know, these things are changing, right, in this area. And, and a few people have touched on this and asked, what about any plants that involve pollination? Has there any been any, any, is there any thoughts, any work, any looking in this area? Um, we, we have, I think I answered in the chat, we have actually had crew pollinate some plants okay. just by shaking leaves. It doesn't, it doesn't take much to get them to do that. I, I know one of my coworkers, more than anything, she wants robotic bees that can do pollinating. Um, I keep <laughs> promising them for her each Christmas. Robotic bees, that, that could be, I guess, an interesting thing. And, and look, you know, and, I, and I know I asked Jacob this, and I think that this kind of faults a, a lot of you, is, and a few people talked about this, is, you know, where do you see some of the potential advances in this technology, say, in space applications relative to Earth? You know, I mean, Caitlin, with some of the water issues, obviously, are big, especially in a 
in, in a world that has issues with climate change and in a continent that is relatively dry, um, you know, where do we see some of the advancements do we think that are going to apply, not just in space, but really where do we think some of the advancements might come breakthrough on here on Earth? I definitely think in the context of recycling, I mean, Rafa mentioned that too, you know, just not creating waste because, uh, you know, ev everything has a value, but it's figuring out how to, once you've basically made something that's some sort of mixture that's not useful, how to repurify it again so that you mm. can actually reuse and, and recycle those components would be a critical part um, of being efficient up there and then also <laughs> stopping waste and being more sustainable down here. Um, I, I would just someone actually just noted in in that about space beer use nutrition plus craft beer. In fact, there is a science week event all about someone who has put a special type of yeast on a high altitude balloon. One of the ones that Ralph mentioned I exposed it to a space like environment, and they have made craft beer. Uh, I mean, I don't see this as an interesting funding opportunity, but maybe in the future, I don't know. You could charge anything you want for craft beer. But it, it, look, recycling seems to be a big thing. Um, conservation, because as a lot of all of you have identified, you know, the issues of weight, restrictions of what you can take and what you can do are, are so heavy there. Um, but a few people have, have asked about what about fungi? Where do fungi fit into this whole discussion? Well, my um, only knowledge of fungi in the space station was that it wasn't supposed to be there <laughs> um, with the fusarium. But um, I mean, you obviously can can induce the environments that fungi need. So I, I don't see any reason why that couldn't be part of a, um, especially a biorenewable um, situation in the future, especially on uh, terrestrial type environments, maybe more so than the space station, but maybe Ralph or Caitlin have a, a better um, answer for that. I think it's really fascinating sure. that the, um, you know, on Earth, we're still just figuring out um, in some cases how amazingly um, wonderful fungi are at benefiting plants here on Earth. Um, and so it'll be really interesting to, to see what directions um, will be taken in the context of engineering the symbiotic relationships for space. Is there anything work on that, Ralph? Yeah, so I was going to say that, you know, my group works primarily with plants and fungi is, is an area out there that really hasn't found a home. I'm trying to bring it under our umbrella because there are a lot of researchers who come up to NASA with proposals, not only for using as a source of food, but potentially for materials for, mm -hmm. um, you know, regenerating um, um, you know, nutrients from waste products, et cetera. So I think there is a big potential application for it. Uh, part of the challenge is when you look at the amount of funding available to do all the different buckets of items that we need to address, the food area itself is a challenge for funding. So getting an offshoot like that is something that's just going to have to take the time. I, I think eventually you will definitely see it play out and be used in multiple areas, uh, but it's just now be beginning to get, uh, I would say, access into the popular culture within the agency. That's actually an interesting comment you just had, uh, Ralph, and maybe a few of you again have an interest in this. But given clearly how you know all of the issues you've talked, all four of you have talked about, and, and I guess five with Shannon, how critical food is to so many and, and water to so many different areas. If everyone really wants to get to these long duration missions, is this going to be an area that just becomes? not just more and more popular, but more and more mainstream, more and more funded. I mean, and Jacob, I think it's interesting of the few grants that the Australian Space Agency has done in this recent round. Um, there was another one that was food related, I think, kind of in a sort of way. Um, you know, this clearly is an identified area that people are doing. So is this going to be coming, is food going to become more and more, let's say popular, but more and more worked upon it and more widespread, do you think? Uh, if I could take the first step at it, I will tell you that from my perspective, I think the big challenge with food is that when you look at capabilities that space vehicles have historically been required to have, food was never an infrastructure system component. 
in mm. that context. It wasn't something that required mass power or volume was just logistics volume. Mass was logistics. Um, so now you, you, you basically are, are coming to acquire resources from people who have already cordoned off their piece of the pie and nobody wants to give that resource up. And, and now there's a new funding stream that needs to come with that. So there's a big challenge in getting or the recognition that food is going to need. Um, another challenge for the near future is that, as Shannon even alluded to, when we start talking about returning to the moon, we're looking at short stays. We're looking at food being used more in the historical context that it was used during Apollo, something just to keep the crew going for a period of one week stays, let's say on the lunar surface. But in the long-term view, Food is a critical component. Um, it, it is going to get its place in the sun. People in the agency are looking at it. It's just a timing thing. And so I think over the next maybe decade or so, you're going to see a struggle as NASA tries to take the limited funds we have and deploy that money into the infrastructure required to get to the moon and to set up shop on the moon. Food may take a little bit of a backseat in the near term. But one of the things I tell people is that when you plan to go on a vacation um, with your family and, and you're thinking about all these places you're going to want to go, everything you're going to want to do, you get in your car, you get on the plane, whatever. When you get there, the first thing you do is look for a place to eat. And so we have to keep that in mind that, th that we have to at least be the ones thinking about the food until the light bulb goes off in everyone's head. Are we there yet? <laughs> We try. <laughs> uh, anyone else wanted to comment on that? No. Sir, uh, if I can comment on this, uh, <laughs> as the unofficial chef of my analog uh, mission, is that food is definitely one of the huge, one of the largest factors that can distinguish between a successful expedition and an exemplary expedition mm. and the difference is very subtle because food is very comforting at an end of the end of a very long day uh having eat, having a large meal can be can improve your mood and your outlook uh on the mission that is going to impact your performance while on the mission not just as an individual but as a as a group and one thing that is very important to to do is that which i hope that uh we do it into the future is that uh group meal times rather than individual meal times uh is equally as important to maintain the 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 group cohesion of of the crew you know, Julio's points are hugely important. Um, there, there's two things I just want to comment on, it, and that is that it's the challenge is it's so hard to quantify that behavioral benefit that you get from the quality of food and from, from things done at mealtime. When you look at space programs, it's all about data analysis, you know, conclusions, proof, tangible documentation. Um, these things are much harder to quantify, but extremely important. And that's why it's, it's critical for folks like Julio to go on these missions. It's for people to listen to astronauts like Shannon and her perceptions, because it's not something that you can necessarily pick up in peer reviewed literature and, and evaluate the results and conclusions in tables and graphs. Yeah, I, I really like that point because it's kind of this this idea that this is such a big part that we kind of all know, but yeah, you can't just point to and say it's five percent of the mission issue, you know, or or, or some value you can quantify. Um, but someone has, someone has slightly asked something that maybe you can, and that is what. And Ralph, I think you touched about this on some of the the long duration return ones, uh, and maybe Julio, you've even experienced this with the the analogs, but. What, what sort of vitamin supplementation would astronauts need on some of these long duration missions? You know, you talked about there's a lot of work going into these nutrients uh, and vitamins, but there may be issues that come back. Is there any work or looking at that or identified needs? So when it comes to vitamins, what I can tell you is that um, 
a couple of quick answers to that. The folks at the Johnson Space Center who are the food systems experts, they're very emphatic about that the crew gets their nutrition from functional foods. Um, very important, that's the best way for us on earth to get it to, setting the, setting the example is you wanna get your nutrients out of the foods that you eat. Um, another thing is people will, and we've had people in the agency say, you know, why not just send vitamin pills if these, if these nutrients are degrading over time? Well. The truth of the matter is that the vitamin pills degrade over time as well. So it's it's not a, it's not necessarily a solution, even if you look at trying to fly more vitamins just mm -hmm. individually in capsules or components. Uh, but again, the real impetus is that we want to get the, the the nutrients in the functional food. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I I personally wouldn't feel very satisfied uh, at the end of the day just eating a pill and and then <laughs> eating another supplement that that gives me enough calories for the energy of the day, that energy has to come from, from as, as what Ralph said, from functional foods and just having food that reminds you of, of eating at home or eating on earth um, kind of grounds you as well. Uh, if rather than, rather than just viewing food as energy versus viewing food as, as, as a necessity or uh, as a luxury, um, we have to look at food from, from rad we need to stop looking at food as just like providing energy to the astronauts and look at it more holistically. And, well, and, and Caitlin and Jacob, you kind of have touched a little bit on some of the new techniques in a variety of ways that we're, we're trying to implement. And, and, and someone's kind of asked about this and I think it's a fair point when we talk about the new techniques and the new things that we're doing, again, especially on Mars, let's say, how careful do we have to be of not screwing up the place for lack of a better phrase, right? You know, how much thought should we be spinning onto not just the techniques to make sure we survive, but make sure, you know, we, we leave the environment, so to speak, as we go. Everyone always says, let's just go terraform Mars. Now, minus the maybe geological issues that may come into play, what else do we need to consider, especially in some of these these things? You know, I mean, I, I think immediately Jacob would talking about weed growth. Do we see automation as being a way of managing that potentially? Um, I think there's a um, one of the the goals of this automation, and especially particularly machine vision, um, is things like uh, fungus growth. And I'm basically if there's um if there's a stress we pick up, it's you know one of three things. There's going to be some sort of biological factor, or there's pro it's probably going to be a nutritional or a water factor with plants of the three, or a lighting factor. But that's pretty easy to diagnose. Um, so if you can rule out the the water and the nutrition, then that's automation and machine vision has a good place there to see. Oh, there's something going wrong, and we need to to look into this. I mean, assuming we just don't want to let everything get out of control and um, and terraform Mars. Now, it, depending on how far you look in the future, I'm sure that'll happen. That's just mm. how, but. Um, in, in the short term, while we're still out there and exploring and stuff, before we make the decision to permanently colonize, you know, another planet, I think we need to be very careful about what we do, what we do or anything that we see could could potentially just be from Earth. We've already seen these these issues arise. Um, with some of the rover missions on Mars is we, you know, new life forms potentially, but did we bring it with us or was it there already? And that's that's not an issue. So, yeah, Caitlin, I don't know if you had any thoughts. Well, I was thinking about, um, you know, and how how often humans have gone into a new environment and and very accidentally done things like introduce cane toads or, <laughs> you know, um, or, or anything they, in Australia at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do have we do have a tendency to, you know, not not unintentionally uh, make make a bit of a mess of things, and and so I think in the in the context of understanding the full implications of everything we do is really important um you know sort of like it's it's going into space is innovation but it has to be responsible innovation and we, and we have to really um you know look through all all the factors what what we're uh, influencing and what the consequences are, are going to be um in in relation to the earlier discussion 
of um, that relationship between food and how we function. You know, our bodies themselves, uh, I think only 43% of the cells that we usually carry around are actually human cells and the rest of them are microbes. So we're sort of like these walking microbial populations. And of course, you know, the plants are used to being like that. And if we were ever gonna terraform a planet, then that's gonna require um, using a multitude of different organisms as well. And we can't always predict how how everything's going to play together. And sometimes it doesn't go right. So it's going to take a lot of really careful science, like the work that, that um, you know, Ralph and Yuli are doing to, to understand uh, how it's going to come together. And, and then also a lot of amazing technology like Jacob's building too, to, to actually, you know, be able to analyze everything that's happening. Well, and, and I'm going to ask this last question. You touched on things going wrong. And just for the audience, I warned people, the panel, I may ask this question, and now I think two or three people have asked this, can you grow potatoes on Mars? Uh, and, and I'd like to talk, I, I think the question is only valid, not because we all hate Matt Damon, but because, um, you know, there, there, I think it gives this view that, well, we don't have backup plans and you don't think about what go wrong, plus then the science of growing things on Mars. And I think it's kind of why people, people are fascinated about it. So. Can you grow potatoes on Mars? This is my, so, Martian's my kid's favorite book. <laughs> it's so good. Go ahead, Ralph. So hydroponically, yeah, you can grow potatoes um, once we get the systems to be able to do that hydroponically. I, I think when you ask a question like that, inherent in that question is, can you take Martian regolith and grow potatoes yeah. in it? And um, Martian regolith, as Matt Damon experienced, is not the Martian regolith that that we will experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are perchlorates in it, there's a, and that we believe perchlorates to be ubiquitous across the surface of Mars. We would have to address the perchlorate uh, issue, and, and it's likely that there are some heavy metals in there that you would not want to consume through the potatoes. So what, what it's going to require is some remediation of the regolith, sourcing the right particle sizes so that you could get the plants to grow. Um, and then you'd probably have to augment that regolith with uh, some nutrients that potatoes would require over time. Um, whether you do that with uh, just adding the nutrients or you have some precursor plants that go in there and, and convert the Martian soil into more usable soil simulating terrestrial soil. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges we look at is because there's all this interest in regolith as being a, a potential source for growing plants. And, and my, my take is that the systems that we arrive with at first will be hydroponic based systems mm -hmm. using experience that we've gained from, you know, um, space flight and, and potentially on the moon. We are looking at regolith, you know, I would say we let the university researchers investigate regolith because there's a lot of interest there and that's more of a far out technology. Mm -hmm. um, Will it eventually happen? I think there has to be a trade made. What makes more sense and what's more feasible? Does it is it to use regolith and convert it into a soil and grow plants that way, or is it to continue with a hydroponic approach? Maybe it's a case where certain plants, larger structure plants, you want to grow with regolith. Maybe it's a case where one of the challenges with hydroponic systems is if they go south, they will go quickly. The plants will be lost with them relatively quickly. So maybe you, you, you remediate some regolith and you design a hybrid system where regolith serves as a buffer to the plant growing system. Um, but the answer is, can it be done? Yes, but could it be done you know, quickly in a way that Matt Damon did? I would say no. Um, he probably would have had a lot greater issues than worrying about what to eat over that period of time. Um, so. nice. This, I actually did this little experiment myself over at MDRS, but I just want to make one comment is that, man, the U.S. has spent a lot of money saving Matt Damon many, many times mm. from many different si situations. <laughs> well, I was going to ask Julia, like, if you're in that, as is in that, in that environment, like, I feel there has to be a lot of psychological issues to resolve. I mean, besides the stress of being left behind, let's ignore that. But to, to reach that point, to, to do that, I feel would it be also as practical as they make out from the, the human implementing it standpoint? Well, when you're, you're in that environment, your, your goal is to survive and you will do anything that you can using the resources 
and the tools uh, that's available to you to to survive. And if you don't have food, then you have to make the food. And using Matt Damien's approach may not be very attractive, but I'd rather use his approach rather than starving. <laughs> That's a fair point. And Brad, I'll tell you, it may be an interesting story. When I first started in this role that I'm in now, I, I, again, I'm not a botanist and I don't know much of anything about horticulture. But um, when the movie came out, people were asking, well, can we grow potatoes in, in our regular simulants that we have? So at the time, there was a popular simulant that uh, NASA had, had you know, chartered to get manufactured. We had access some, to some of it. So I took some uh, seed potatoes and put them in there or slip potatoes, put them in there and grew them. And I grew them for generationally for like four or five iterations. Um, each time the potatoes got smaller and smaller, <laughs> each time the plants flowered quicker. Um, and, you know, I, I first had the first potato I grew, I went to um, one of our lead um, plant um, scientists and said, hey, I got a potato. And, and they looked at me and said, don't eat that. <laughs> so, so, but that's my personal experience. I, I don't think you could survive over them. The potato, the largest potato I actually grew is just a, a very small potato. So interesting. Good to hear. Um, look, I know we've gone massively over time. Thank you to everyone, all our panelists. Um, it's been fantastic to hear from all of you. Um, and thank you to everyone for listening.